that will be what a day that will be when he returns but in the meantime we just keep celebrating him
amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind. taught my heart to fear and raise my fears greatly. Oh, how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are
Amen. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we can celebrate what Yeshua has done for us. Lord, that you have redeemed with a mighty outstretched arm, and through him you've purchased a people unto yourself. I thank you for the hope we have. I thank you for the redemption, the amazing grace poured out on us. We give you glory this morning, and thank you in the name of Yeshua. Amen. So as we usually do, did anybody have anything during worship that you saw or wanted to share? I just thought of my original salvation and what the Lord did and how truly he set me free and just went from darkness, really, and stuckness and everything into abiding eternal life in his presence and even when I stepped outside in the cold and the dark in that wintry sort of night, it was like, oh, he's here. He's still here. And just how he never has stopped. How he just praising him. Just and day by day, chains are breaking off more and more all the time as we seek him. And I'm just so grateful, so thankful for the power and everything he's done that he sets us free to be like him, yes. you know. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, the joy that comes. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Yes, amen. So, here we are at a resurrection service. I'm so glad to be able to come together and to celebrate the risen king. You know, t uh, two nights ago, we sat down to have Passover seders to remember the exodus from Egypt, to remember the death of Yeshua, and that God has redeemed a people through the blood of the lamb, which is beautiful. And the thing is, that's, that's one of the steps of redemption, of God's plan of restoration. It's a critical component uh, that we need to celebrate, and it's important to celebrate. But beyond that, it's of great importance to celebrate the resurrection too, because without the resurrection, the hope of the age to come has not been essentially um, affirmed, stamped, and guaranteed and to a greater degree. So let me say that uh, I don't want to say that God's word wasn't true until Yeshua resurrected because his word is true and his word is always established. But through the resurrection of Yeshua, he demonstrated without a doubt that Yeshua is the chosen Messiah, the one who is bringing redemption and who guarantees the coming age when the Father will send him and he will establish the throne of David in Jerusalem and all the world will come under his rule and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he has been made Lord of all. And, you know, we, sometimes, uh, so, uh, you know, the resurrection is integral to the death of Yeshua. It's needed for what goes ahead. Just as we often talk about Passover not being complete without Shavuot without Pentecost. And the reason why is God has redeemed a people for himself. He set them free from Pharaoh's rule. He set them free from the rulers of this world. But once free from the rulers of this world, what are they then a part of, if not part of his family? And if not brought into relationship with him and covenant with him? And that's one of the things that's very important too in this process is counting up the Omer. We, be, we began counting the Omer last night, and we count from one up to 50. And on the 50th day, we celebrate Shavuot. We're counting up to it, almost as though you're walking up the steps of the temple, approaching God's presence, coming nearer day by day to the day of his revelation, because that's when he came down in fire on Mount Sinai. That's when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Shavuot, on the day of Pentecost a greater revelation 
of God and our relationship with him. So each day we count up, we prepare ourselves for that coming day, just as we prepared for Passover. We were getting the chametz out. We were removing all of the leaven. And why do we remove the leaven? It's because God has made his people pure, not to be defiled by the things of the past. Right? And I, I talked about this a little bit at the Seder um, the other night, but I think it's an important part of even the imagery of understanding the getting out the leaven is that when you are baking bread, you, they would take a piece of the, of the batch and they would set it aside and it would continue to ferment and it would be a starter for the next batch. So they would bake the bread and then they'd have their starter. Well, the next time you get some flour and you're getting ready to make a batch, what do you do? You take what was left from before, which is fermented, you add it and it spreads and it fills the whole thing. You take a little piece, save it for later, okay? That little piece, you don't get to eat it. It's not edible, but it's important for making the edible food. And so, but what happens is with each new batch, you're taking some of the old and putting it into it and it's now regenerating itself. And if you've been made a new batch, you do not want to be leavened with what God removed from you, with the former. So it's like, okay, so I walked in a body that was sin and corruptible, and it was with malice and envy. That's the starter. That starter has no place coming into me who's been made a new batch. Instead, I need to be a pure batch that then has the natural fermentation that occurs, and then we save a piece of that for the next batch. So we're recreating the new batch that's been pure, not tainted and old. That's why we get the leaven out, because this week we're saying, no, there is no fermentation. There is no decay in us. We are not part of the old batch. We are a new batch. And when this week is done and we have go back to having leavened bread, or the leavened bread is out of sincerity and truth, not out of malice and envy. Okay, so there, that's a key aspect to understanding what, what Paul was talking about with getting the chametz out and giving that as an image for people. And of course, that's what God was giving as well. Now, there's the five species of the land of Israel that we uh, get out of our homes, right? I mean, di different communities have different uh, practices. Sometimes they do get rid of all grains and even beans and various things. But the core is the five grains of the land of Israel. Now, why the five grains of the land of Israel? Well, because that is the, that is the seed that is sown in the land that brings forth a harvest. What is the harvest but the people of God? Okay, so the land brings forth the people. The, the five grains represent the people of God. And so those people are not to become leavened with the old leaven. The rice and other things like that, they can become leavened, but they don't represent the harvest. Okay, so um, that's, that's a key aspect of the leavening and getting that out, and the new newness that we begin to walk in. We're a new batch. All right, and so we're made that way. We're made a new creation by God. You know, and there's a symbolism in baptism of the death and the rebirth. Same kind of aspect here of getting out the leaven and being a new batch. It's one that is, it's a picture of what's to come where this body, which is corruptible, will pass away, but we will be made incorruptible, the new creation. So we're, we're seeing pictures of it here that's foretelling a future reality, okay? Um, so many times within Christianity or teaching, there's an idea that everything's already been done, already fulfilled, already completed through Yeshua, and even like we're completely whole and pure and new, but the reality is we're still walking in a fallen world. We're still walking out this life in this flesh. And the fullness is guaranteed to come. And that should bring us great joy. To know that the fullness has come, it is coming. And right now we're walking in a foretaste, but it's going to be even better. Right? If this fallen world, if our fallen state is the best that it's going to be, then I'd say that our hope is well, it's too little. It's, it's just too little. <laughs> you know, and, and Paul talks in 
1 Corinthians 15 about how if we have only hoped in Messiah for this life, then we are most people to be pitied. Why? Because there's something even better. There's something greater that he purchased. And our hope is in the fullness of what, he's, what he has purchased, which is the life to come, because he has gone as the first fruits of the resurrection, the forerunner going before us to then bring us into the place where he is, right? Now, the place when I say the place where he is, I'm not talking about heaven. I'm talking about here on earth with him ruling. Now, right now, he's seated at the right hand of the Father, but his intent is to return when his Father sends him, and here he will be, and he says, where I am, you will be with me, right? So we'll get to rule and reign on the earth with him. We will be in his presence, and uh, it's going to be glorious. It'll be a glorious day, as we sang earlier, praise God. Um, okay, so since I'm already talking about the resurrection, let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Um, all right, and 1 Corinthians 15, the whole chapter is fantastic. We're not going to read the whole chapter. Who knows, we may. Probably not. <laughs> but 1 Corinthians 15, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, the Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of, a, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Now jumping forward to verse 12. Now if Messiah is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Right? Because at the time, the Sadducees primarily believed, well, that there was no resurrection of the dead and you just lived for what we could get in this life. There wasn't the reward of the age to come. But the Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead. Yeshua taught the resurrection of the dead. And he goes on and says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Messiah has been raised. And if Messiah has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Messiah, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Messiah has been raised. And if Messiah has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. And also, those who have fallen asleep, even those to, who Yeshua appeared to after his resurrection, then they will have perished as well. And if in Messiah we have hope, we have hope only in this life, then we are of most people to be pity, pitied. But in fact, Messiah has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Messiah shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Messiah the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Messiah. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, right? So God is going to place all things into subjection under Yeshua's feet. When Yeshua comes back in the day of the Lord, he will be, be bringing judgment on the rulers of this world, of this earth, and he will be establishing the, the rightful throne in Jerusalem. And during the thousand-year reign, he's going to be bringing all things into subjection under his feet. And then the last enemy to be destroyed is death there at the end of the messianic era. And at that time, Yeshua turns everything over to the Father. All right? It's a beautiful picture. But this, even the day, you know, the, the messianic era that we look forward to, this thousand year reign, is going to be a glorious day. It's also going to, going to be a period of transition leading up to the ultimate glorious day in the age to come. Right? When there is no need of the sun or the moon or of the temple, for God and the Lamb are the temple, and the Lamb, the lamb is the lamp. Right? It's going to be beautiful. And 
one thing that we have in this with the resurrection of Yeshua, as I mentioned before, there's an assurance that God is bringing forth his promises. You know, he came at a time when there was great darkness covering the land. At a time when the children of Israel were under oppression by the Romans. And they continued to be under the oppression by the Romans because the brothers betrayed Yeshua and they turned him over to death instead of recognizing him as the coming king. And so the exile continues. But just as Joseph loved his brothers even still after his long separation from them, so too Yeshua loves his brothers and is going to bring the day of his revelation and the day of reconciliation. You know, one of the things that we talked about in the Seder was the part of the telling where we read the Vahisha Amda. And this has stood for us. And it actually says, this is what has stood by our fathers and us. For not just one nation alone has risen against us to destroy us, but in every generation they rise against us to destroy us. And the Holy One, blessed is He, rescues us from their hand. Now, what are they talking about when they say, this is what has stood by our fathers and for us? Last night we had a, a, a second Seder in the home. It was wonderful. Uh, we've done that the past two years, and it's so nice to sit and be able to talk and discuss. And so many great questions were asked and um, observations were made. But what, the, the, what we say in the Seder that immediately precedes this part is the recounting of God fulfilling his promises and saying God swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he would bless them and that he would give them the land of Canaan. And to Esau, he gave Mount Seir and he sent Jacob down into Egypt. And then, and then you say, bless God for his faithfulness to Israel. And when you bless God for his faithfulness to Israel at that moment, you should feel there's a contradiction taking place. There's something that's not right. Because you've just said, I'm telling the story of the Exodus, and God is faithful, and he's made promises, and look, he gave Esau his land, and he gave Jacob captivity. And then you say, blessed be God for his faithfulness to keep his promises to Israel. And you're like, wait a second. You promised Israel the land, and you just said you gave Esau his land, but you sent Jacob, Israel, into captivity. How can we bless you for keeping your promises? Because it's a proclamation that God will keep his promise no matter what the circumstance looks like today. Yes, Jacob went down into Egypt and he was there for 210 years. 116 of those were brutal slavery. And yet God was still faithful to keep his promise because he had even told Abraham at the covenant of the parts that 400 years your offspring will be in a land not their own. And during that time they will be oppressed by a people, but I will bring them out with great wealth. And what are we talking about with the Exodus? God did what he said, even though the promise tarried. So even today, as we await the coming of Yeshua and we say, how long, O Lord, until you send our deliverance, until you send the final redemption, we can still say God is faithful and he's going to fulfill his word that he gave to Abraham. And now he's given us assurances along the way. He brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. And we say, has any other nation been brought out in such a way with great miracles, signs and wonders? No, God did it to say, I will establish my promises no matter the odds. And now death cannot hold my son. Death cannot hold the Messiah. And his resurrection is an assur further assurance to you that the final redemption is to come and your glorious day will arrive. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. So today, again, we're celebrating the risen Lord because of the reality of the resurrection and the reality of the final redemption. And we can say, blessed be God who is faithful to keep his promises. And as we're walking in this, we're in a holy time, seven weeks set apart to say, oh Lord, bring a revelation of who you are. Give us a greater window into your beauty that we may walk as this new batch, pure and undefiled, giving glory to your name, making testimony 
of your goodness and greatness that all the nations may know that we may go as forerunners preparing the way of the Lord in the spirit of Elijah. And that when we gather together on the day of Shavuot this year, that it would be a great celebration of the good things that you have done and the promises to come. So may we count the Omer, may we walk together, awaken, prepare, and every day rejoice in the resurrection and the new life that we have, the promises that God will fulfill. Amen. Father, we give you glory and thanks and praise for your goodness. Lord, you are mighty and awesome, and there is no one like you. We thank you for your testimonies. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Bahisha Amda, your promises have stood for us and always will. We give you glory and praise in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Is there anything that anyone wanted to share before we go into more worship? Okay, so we're going to go into a time of worship now, and during this time of worship, so we're going to have a song, and then there's going to be an opportunity, open mic, for anyone who would like to pray for Israel, because what we're wanting to do right now is just cover the people and the land, as during this time they are in a war, a war not just with Hamas, but with all the nations that surround them in varying degrees, whether it's outright or undercover. The nations are rising against Israel, and the support of the United States is even in question to some degree. The United Nations recently has said that they are wanting to bring uh, charges of like uh, atrocities of war and human rights violations by the IDF, when it's insane that they don't say anything about China or about Hamas and what they've done and the, and the hostages they still hold. But somehow the nations look at Israel and say, you're the wicked one, but it's the nations that are walking in wickedness and rising against them. But God is going to stand for his people. And though they may endure hardship, they will come through. He has preserved a remnant. He will bring a remnant up and he will establish Israel as the chief of the mountains and send Yeshua to reign. May he send Yeshua quickly and speedily in our days. I guess I've already started the prayer. But now let's go into some worship and we'll allow uh, time for prayer as well. Uh, and let's just give glory to God. Amen. So I just encourage you to, to prepare your heart through this song. I'm going to sing Waymaker. I'm going to sing most of it in English, but the chorus I'm going to sing in English and in Hebrew. And the guy that's translated into Hebrew, me and my dad are friends with him, and he, um, we were talking to him, and he was telling my dad that when he translated, when he translated the song into Hebrew that some of the words he had to change a little bit. And I thought it was significant. One thing that really stood out in my mind when he talked about that was he said that he changed where it says promise keeper. He changed it into Hebrew where it literally means covenant keeper. And so I don't know if you're able to sing the Hebrew part, but just keep that in mind that that's what we're, when I sing that, that I'm singing that he is, that he is the covenant keeping God of Israel. And, you know, just as Moses called that to God's remembrance, we're calling that to his remembrance that he is the covenant-keeping God of Israel. So, Lord, I just welcome your presence. We welcome your presence. Lord, we can't worship without you. We can't pray without you. So we just welcome you, Lord, to come and have your way during this time of worship and intercession. Lord, reveal your heart to us your thoughts to us about your people, your precious people, Israel, that are the apple of your eye. I just pray, Lord, that you pour out your spirit in this place, pour out a spirit of supplication and grace, pour out anointing for intercession, Lord. I just pray that uh, you'd pour out 
a spirit of boldness, intercession, that there would be no fear or intimidation about praying, God, but that people would just pray with your heart and pray boldly uh, for Israel. So we just we just welcome you and we worship you, Lord.
thank you that even when Israel maybe they can't see it, maybe they don't feel like you're with them, but we thank you God that you are with them. We thank you God that you are faithful to your people Israel and that you are working and moving even when they don't see it even when they don't feel it, you're right there with them and you are working and moving on their behalf Lord. Thank you Lord for your faithfulness to Israel God we just enter into your gates with praise and thanksgiving we enter into your gates with praise and thanksgiving. We thank you, God, for your faithfulness to Israel. We thank you for your faithfulness to your covenant, to all your promises, Lord. They will not fail. Your love will not fail. Your promises will not fail, God. You cannot fail, Israel. You are not a man that you should lie. We just thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. And we just call this into remembrance, Lord, your faithfulness and your promises. Psalm 92, part of Psalm 93. And I say this on behalf of your children in Israel because this is where their heart is. And just as was just mentioned, even when we lose our way, you do not. You are a faithful covenant keeper. And so we say this with your people and on behalf of your people as watchmen on the wall. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, proclaiming your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night to the music of the ten-string lyre and the melody of the harp. For you make us glad by your deeds, O Lord. We sing for joy at what your hands have done in the past and are doing now and will do. How great are your works, O Lord, how profound your thoughts. Senseless people do not know. Fools, by definition, don't understand that though the wicked spring up like grass and all the evildoers look like they flourish, they will be destroyed forever. But you, O Lord, are forever exalted. For surely your enemies, Lord, surely your enemies will perish and all evildoers will be scattered. Everyone coming against you now. You have exalted um, Israel's horn like King David, like Messiah Yeshua, like that of a wild ox. Fine oils have been poured on the king. Our eyes have seen the defeat of our adversaries and our ears have heard the rout of our wicked foes. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree and they will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. 
they will bear fruit in old age and they will stay fresh and young proclaiming the Lord is upright he is our rock and there's no wickedness in him and from Psalm 93 the Lord reigns he is robed in majesty the Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength indeed the world is firmly established firm and secure and your th your throne was established long ago and you are from all eternity no matter how the seas lift up O oh Lord no matter how they lift their voice no matter how much the waves pound but mightier than the thunder of the great waters mightier than the breakers of the sea is the Lord on high almighty your statutes Lord stand firm and holiness adorns your house forevermore amen cover your people I think for 2,000 years, the uh, Christian religions have told the Christian people that uh, that their that Judaism and Christianity are two separate religions, and Jews have told the people the, the Jews the same thing. What I like to tell people is that, and I may have mentioned this before to some of you, but. The actual translation, when you say grafted in, that's really not real, real accurate because the word, the Hebrew word is net, the root word is netzer, which is offshoot of the root, the original root. So you're talking about two groups that are part of one family. Um, but they, but you have to think of how families function. They don't always get along. You know, your brother says something about your kids and you don't like it and they are insulting you at times, you know, and it's like, when I lived in the old city of Jerusalem uh, as a young man, uh, we were, I think back then, the only Messianic congregation in Jerusalem. And we weren't liked by a lot of Jews. They were very nasty to us at times. I don't like to talk about it, but we always knew we were part of one family. And that's what we need to pray for, for our, whether you're a Jew or a non-Jew, doesn't make any difference if you have the Lord Yeshua in your heart. Uh, and, and we really need to uplift our brothers and sisters over there now, because what they're going through is really horrible. When you think about it, supposedly they're, the latest reports are there's only 20 hostages alive and we should uplift those 20 hostages and their families too. Imagine what they're going through. Lord, we look to you now, Father. We uplift our brothers and sisters in Israel. Touch them, keep them safe, bring them through all of this, Lord. And continue your blessing on them and those that support them. Lord, we just turn them over to you, put them in your hands. Beshem Yeshua. Yes, Father, for our brothers and sisters in Israel who have who have seen and been through just horribly unimaginable things, God, in the last several months in a dark, dark place. As we just sang, may you be the light there, I pray. And for those hostages who are left alive, who are in a dark place that we just can't even fathom, Lord, that there is no place so dark that your light can't break through. And we pray that you would be a light to them. We pray that you would send Yeshua to stand next to them. for the wickedness around them, Lord, that it, they would be brought to justice. And we pray for the people who are under the influence and the brainwashing of the wicked 
rulers of those places, Lord, that you would open their eyes, that they would even be able to see the wickedness that they have stood under that, and see how evil it is, Lord, that you would let them see what is good and what is wrong and that they would turn against even those their own rulers, Lord, that you would bring wickedness down. God, and we pray for the people of Israel that you would give them perseverance, that even as all of the world rails against them and spouts lies against them, you would help them to stand in truth, Lord, that you would raise up prophets of this generation, Lord, to encourage your people. that you keep the people of Israel united against their, their common enemy. We also pray that you uh, plant confusion in the enemy armies and that you uh, cause the people of Iran to see the evil of their leaders and to separate themselves from them. We pray that uh, Israel uh, complete uh, what they need to do in uh, Gaza, and you protect them from uh, Lebanon. We're thankful, Lord, that they were uh, able to uh, have the systems to, to protect themselves this last time around. We thank you, Lord, how you orchestrated all of that to make that happen, even starting years ago. Um, so thank you, Lord, for that. We pray that they will continue to to have the weapons they need but we know Lord that you're the one that fights for them and can confuse their enemies and destroy their enemies from both uh, without and within um, cause the people who surround them to uh, have a holy fear of Israel and to understand that to go against Israel is to uh, seal their own destruction so thank you Lord protect them, guide them give them wisdom and uh, let them continue to be united with courage. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Joel 2, starting in verse 15. Blow a trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing infants, let the bridegroom come, bridegroom come out of his room, and the bride out of her bridal chamber. Let the priests, the Lord's ministers, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and do not make thine inheritance a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they among the people say, Where is their God? Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and will have pity on his people. And the Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I am going to send you grain, new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied and full with them, and I will never again make you a, re a reproach among the nations, but I will remove the northern army far from you, and I will drive it into a parched and desolate land, and its vanguard into the eastern sea, and its rear guard into the western sea. And its stench will rise, and its foul smell will come up, for it has done great awful things. Do not fear, O land, rejoice and be glad, for the Lord has done great things. Do not fear, beasts of the field, for the, pa for the pastures of the wilderness have turned green, for the tree has borne its fruit, the fig tree and the vine have yielded in full. So rejoice, O sons of Zion, and be glad in the Lord your God, for he has given you the early rain for your vindication, and he has poured, poured down for you the rain, the early and latter rain as before. And the threshing floors will be full of grain, and the vats will overflow with the new wine and oil. Then I will make up to you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the creeping locust, the, stri the stripping locust, and the gnawing locust, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall have plenty to eat and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. 
then my people will never be put to shame. Then you will know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God, and there is no other, and my people will never be put to shame. And it will come about after this, that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions, and even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and I will display wonders in the sky and the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape. As the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Lord, we thank you that you are the deliverer. You are the one who brings judgment. You are the one who brings freedom. And Lord, you uphold your promises, uphold your people, that they will not be put to shame, but that you will be known as their deliverer, and all the nations on earth will behold your power and your might and kneel before you. We thank you, Lord, and we bless you. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. So I wanted just to close with uh, the blessing, sing it over our families, but singing it over Israel. From here in Houston, Kingwood, Texas, we're sending out love and blessings to Israel. May 
make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Oh, shalom unto you, Yerushalayim. Amen. I wanted to say thank you to Jamie and David for leading us in worship this morning. It was wonderful. Uh, yeah. And um, yes, what a beautiful time of celebrating and interceding for Israel and God's plans and purposes on the earth. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for this family. Thank you for your love. We bless you in the name of Yeshua. Amen. And now uh, Jim is going to say the ironic benediction. Yevarechecha Adonai vayishmerecha Yeer Adonai panavelecha vichunecha Yisa Adonai panavelecha veosem lecha shalom The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom, shalom, shalom alechem.